to today's word. Um, we're going to be, amen. Yes. Yeah, Roger, come on, say something meaningful. Um, all right. So let's open up the word to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. It reads, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. If I can get these lights on here, please. Um, Let let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, my God, for this time to gather. Thank you for the wonderful spirit of worship. Thank you, Lord, for for the joy of your people. My God, just thank you for being here with us. I ask, my God, that today you would open our ears to hear and soften our hearts to receive the words you have for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of today's message is The Reasons Why. The Reasons Why. We touched there in verse 15 that you should be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you. I saw this thing, and and many of you may have picked up on me, but uh, the sermons that the Lord usually has me share to you, they're not prepared weeks in advance. They're usually things that happen and occur that week. Usually, as as I've used this expression, I, I believe the Lord desires us to bring fresh produce to market that we'll pick the fruit fresh off the tree and bring it right to market, fresh. And uh, I saw this thing uh, in, in Instagram or to our young people, IG, right? That's what you guys call it? Okay. Uh, us older people, we have to call it Instagram. Is that two words? Is it one word? You know, we need to know that stuff. But in this, this one Instagram reel, I saw this young man at a college campus with a little microphone and a speaker, and he was professing Christ and just letting people know Jesus loves them. And this young lady just comes up to him with, you know, two finger salutes, you know, one from each hand and saying some, you know, unkind words and, and just being very aggressive and hostile and saying, he's not real. He's not real talking about Jesus. And I just, as in the, in the vein of of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it speaks about that some were called to be apostles and some were called to be pastors and evangelists and teachers. And why? We're called for the equipping of the saints. And, and, and so one of, them, and one of the things I, I hope that the Lord has used me effectively for is to help um, um, equip you with the word of the Lord to hopefully inspire you and motivate you to do more for the Lord because I think we can always all be doing more. I think if we're honest with ourselves, right? And, uh, but, but sometimes just this equipping sometimes requires some, some teaching. And so today is, is probably more teaching than it is anything motivational or inspirational. But also when you're equipped with how to and equipped to understand something, it actually gives confidence so you can more effectively serve the kingdom and represent the Lord. And, and in, 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 this, in this, you know, concept of this person approaching this believer, and, and I've, I've heard things, because I've used some of these things, that, you know, Christianity is a fairy tale, it's a bunch of stories made up, you know, Jesus is no more real than, than King Arthur, you know, and things like that. And, and, and these are things that, that I've heard over the years. And, 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 it's, and it's disheartening. Even in a recent survey in England, conducted by the Church of England, amongst so-called churchgoers, they surveyed back in 2015, they surveyed churchgoers in the Church of England back in 2015 that 22% of the people going to church didn't believe that Jesus was real, that he was just a, a character in this book called the Bible, and that he wasn't really real, like he was maybe like a Santa Claus, right? We, you know, we, we you notice that Schools have no problem promoting Santa Claus. That I'm sorry, but he's not real. Okay, sorry. But but then we mentioned Jesus in the school, and now we got a problem, right? And so they'd rather propagate a lie, but deny the truth. 
And, and so I, I think there, there's some things that we as Christians sometimes are faced with in our daily walk. And, and we're going to cover four questions that Christians are often asked. Actually, it started out with six, but then when I saw how lengthy this, these notes were, I, we, we, we shaved a couple off, and maybe they'll be picked up another time as a continuation of this. But there's four questions we want to help you answer. Does God exist? One. Can the Bible be trusted? Two. Is Jesus the Son of God? And did he rise from the dead? Now, this is, can be kind of grouped in a category people call apologetics. And all, and all apologetics is the fancy word to, to define the defending or justifying your beliefs. All right, and has anybody heard that word apologetics before? And sometimes I, I, I don't like it because I feel like I'm apologizing for my faith, and I'm not. That's not what it means, but it means to defend. It means to, to um, you know, be able to explain why you believe what you believe. And so let's get into to some of these. And hopefully this will be helpful for you. And we have, we have some notes like this that'll pop up to kind of help you maybe take some notes. But again, the purpose here, as in Ephesians 4, 12, is to equip you, is to prepare you. And especially for like this young group, you're back in school now, and you're going to face sometimes questions, and people are going to question you about the existence of God. And, and maybe these things can help you and equip you help answer those people. And so does God exist? And immediately, doubters, skeptics, demand evidence. I want evidence. you got to show me that God exists. Well, see, for me, it's, it's, as I become a born-again believer, it's easy. Romans 1.20 is for me. It reads, it reads that since the, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. I see, and you've heard me say, I see God in everything. I see God in the blue sky, the yellow grass, you know, the, <laughs> I see him, I see him, I see him in your smiling faces. I see him when I hug you on Sunday mornings. I see him everywhere. But to the non-believer, they don't see things that way, right? They don't see the world the way believers, this is, this is why, you know, Jesus clearly tells us in John chapter three, verse three, you must be born again. So that you can see things anew. You know, the song Amazing Grace is so wonderful, right? I was blind and now I see. This happened to me. You know my story. I didn't come to Christ till I was 26. I wasn't raised in the church. This is why maybe I don't sound preachy, I've been told. I've been told, you don't sound like a preacher. You know, and, um, and when I was younger, I was told I don't look like a preacher. But I guess now as I get older, I'm looking more like one. But, uh, but, 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 but I, 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 I see things differently now than how I used to before I was saved. And I saw what Christ has done, done for me. And, and so we have this dilemma for people that don't know Christ like we know Christ. They say, well, how does God, I don't believe there's even a God. How can you explain God? Show me God, they want to say. And I say, well, here he is. It's everywhere. All this comes from God because science, believe it or not, they have theories, but they cannot explain the existence of life, the existence of the universe. There's this thing that in the, in the scientific realm and in, in, in physics is called the space-time-matter continuum, okay? And the space-time-matter continuum was something that was taught to Albert Einstein from a, his, his college mathematician professor, named Herman uh, M Minkowski. And Minkowski had theorized that space, time, and matter must all coexist at the same time. Because if you don't have space, you can't have time, because time is a measurement. And so you require space to have time. And you can't have matter without space, because then where are you going to put the matter if you have no space? And, and so... so they, they theorize that all these things are required simultaneously. And Einstein took it kind of one step further because Einstein indicated and theorized that matter and energy will affect space. Now, Einstein's theory of relativity is energy equals mass times, what is it? Somebody help me. What's the C? it? Constant. The constant of light? Got it. Okay. All right. 
I ain't that smart. E equals MC squared. <laughs> if I only had a brain. But he's saying that matter and energy affect the time-space continuum. So where does all this come from? Because causality is a major uh, point of science. There has to be a cause and effect for everything. What's the cause? What caused matter to even exist? But matter can exist without energy. And, and, and again, so this is the problem that science has. Believe it or not, as much as science wants to try to explain life, they cannot. They're still trying to answer this. Where did the matter come from? Where did the energy come from? Well, I have the answer for you. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It reads, in the beginning, time. God created energy, the heavens and the earth, space and matter. It's all covered right there. Space, matter, time, energy, God created. It's all right there. It's all right, it's all right there in that one, that one verse. Explains it all. Yet science is still trying to understand it and identify and explain, and they cannot. They, several months ago, I, I showed you the Miller experiment that was once used to explain the origins of human life or, or, or organic living organisms here on the earth. And I explained to you how hydrogen is one of the key elements that they used for that test. And I explained to you how hydrogen is the lightest element known on the periodic table. And so a hydrogen will just float into the, out of the atmosphere and into space. And so how is hydrogen contained then in the atmosphere so it can be involved in this biochemical process? And the Miller experiment solved that problem by conducting an experiment in glass tubes where the hydrogen couldn't leave. So you see, so, so there's a fallacy in that experiment. And so, so science still cannot. And, and so even in these, these scientific theorists, they, they, will, they will talk about... Um, the gap theory, that God just fills the gaps of the things that cannot be explained by science. And they say, and even Hawkins, you ever heard of Hawkins, a great um, uh, scientist? He, he even said that we'll give science time and we'll get the answers. But they don't have the answers. And it's been thousands of years and they still don't have the answers because the answer is in Genesis 1.1. They're looking in the wrong place. They're not looking to where it needs to be. But so hopefully, and then, and then again, there's this whole concept about energy, right? In Psalm 33, verse 6, it reads that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the word of the Lord, right? He spoke. He spoke. And it reads that by the breath of his mouth, by the breath of his mouth. And that word breath there in Hebrew is ruach, his spirit. That his spirit is the power that gives life. And there's the energy that Einstein is looking for to support Minkowski's space-time-matter continuum. The energy is God. He's got, and, then, and then, and of course, I, listen, I was one of those smart Alec college students. Okay, I, I, was, I was really big in philosophy classes in college. I thought I knew everything. And, and so, so I would say, okay, well, who, where, where'd God come from? God is outside of time. God is, is before time. God controls time. And in Psalm 90, verse, verse 4, a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passed. Meaning that when he looks at yesterday, when he looks at Saturday, that's like a thousand years. And then in, in 2 Peter 3, 8, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. God is, is beyond time. He, he, he's outside of time. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. God made the promise before time began. So, see, he's outside of time. He's outside our realm of understanding of existence. And so when people ask this question, where did God come from? He is beyond, he's outside of our realm. He's outside of our existence. Because all science has done for years is try to find an explanation for it, but they have yet to find that explanation. Because again, they're looking in the wrong place. They're not looking to God for the answer. They're looking to themselves for the answer. Remember, we're finite beings trying to comprehend an infinite God. All right? And, and so hopefully you can see here, just with this 
time matter space uh, continuum that that science can't explain where matter came from. They, they, where, where did it come from? Where did matter come from? They talk about the Big Bang theory that there was all this matter and there was a Big Bang. What again? Back to cause, causality. What caused the Big Bang? God said, "Let it be," and there was light. That was the, that was the energy source. God was the energy source. They cannot they cannot define and identify that energy source. It cannot be done. It can't. Question number two: Can the Bible be trusted? After all, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and is inspired by God. All scripture is God breathed. There, there's that word breathe again. We, we, we just read it in, in, uh, in Psalm 33, 6. God breathes, right? And he breathes the word of God to us. All right, but then people will, will question, well, is it reliable? Because man wrote it. All these different authors over the years and thousands of years. Imagine this. All these 40 different authors over 1,500 years writing the same message, the same theme. I, I mean, it, it, that has to be inspired by God, divinely inspired by God. All right, and then what happens is, is that we find the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, and, the, and they had the, it has the largest collection of the book of Isaiah in those scrolls. And the level of accuracy from these scrolls that they believe date back to um, the first century A.D., were consistent with the book of Isaiah written 700, 800 years before because it's written 700 B.C. It's when the book of Isaiah was written, about 740 B.C. It's when the book of Isaiah was written. These Dead Sea Scrolls were believed to be from the first century A.D., so that would be 800 years difference there. It's accurate, and then that writing is consistent with what's in today's book of Isaiah. So it supports that the, the accuracy is there. Because why? Because this is God's divine word that was inspired. People were very careful and meticulous in, in describing this and, in, and, and passing it on. And so we, we, have, we have these historical writings to show that it is accurate. Not only that, has anybody ever heard of Alexander the Great? Did you know that Alexander the Great's earliest writings of his life were written 300 years after his life. So they were relying, re, relying on oral interpretation, oral stories of history for Alexander the Great before it was recorded. 300 years. But yet, any history book you find in the Western civilization has Alexander the Great in there and his exploits and, and Cleopatra and all that stuff, and it's believed as reliable history. Yet the Bible, the Gospels, Matthew and John, firsthand accounts, eyewitnesses, written within 100 years of the life of Jesus, yet that is questioned. And yet the reliability and accuracy of the time frame from which that was written versus the stories of Alexander the Great, superseded by 200 years, at least. And yet people question the authenticity. Buddha. Hit the writings of Buddha's life were written over 500 years after his life. And yet we have, said the Gospels, firsthand accounts. The book of 1 Corinthians is believed to have been written around 50 AD, within 20 years of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' death and resurrection, the book of Corinthians, within 20 years. Far more accurate than 500 years for Buddha or 300 years for Alexander the Great. And so if you're going to accept those writings, then you must accept the authenticity of the Holy Scriptures. Amen? All right, moving on to point number, question number three. Did Jesus exist, and is he the Son of God? So again, I'm going to go to historical writings, because for me to sit here and just quote the Bible, that's what's called circular reasoning, right? And I'm, I'm using my belief in the Bible to explain the Bible, Right, so you see the circular reasoning there. And so I'm going to, get, again, go to some outside sources of the Bible that are historically and secularly accepted as being accurate writings of history. And so there's a Caius Cornelius Tacitus. Caius Cornelius Tacitus. And he wrote a book, a historical book called Annals, uh, in the 11, 
uh, 11, four, I'm sorry, 114 AD. He was a Roman senator and a historian. And I think I gave you a slide. Okay, it reads that Nero, sub this is what he wrote, Nero substituted as culprits and punished in the most unusual ways those hated for their shameful acts. This is speaking about the arena where Emperor Nero of Rome was torturing Christians and other people that were criminals to the state of the Roman Empire. And he goes, whom the crowd called Crestians. This is how he spelled it with an E, not an I. That's not a misprint. That's how it was spelled. Crestians. The founder of his name, Christ, or Christus, as was written in Latin. So he, they're writing about these Christians, followers of Christ, being killed in the arena in Rome. And they had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procur, uh, procurator Pontius Pilate. Boy, we've read that name before, haven't we? Again, this is a historical uh, document of a Roman senator. Suppressed for a time, the deadly superstition erupted again, not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, but also in the city of Rome. So this is a historical writing identifying Christ, ex explaining that they were, they were being killed in Rome, that they started in Judea, which is where Jerusalem was. Remember the, the two kingdoms, Israel's the northern kingdom, Judea the southern kingdom, the city of Jerusalem rests in the southern kingdom of Judea. And so here it is in, in the writings of history. Also uh, uh, commonly referred to in Christian circles is the historian Josephus. And he actually records two different accounts of Jesus in what's called book number 20 of his writings and book number 18. Here's an excerpt from book 18 of uh, the book of Josephus. And it reads, around this time, it's actually called the Jewish Antiquities. Uh, around this time, there lived a wise man. If needed, one ought to call him a man, for he was one who did surprising deeds. Miracles, okay? And a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah, when Pilate, upon hearing him, accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified. This is a historical writing that is largely accepted as, as valuable, credible, historical writings. All right, and, and so here, here are two examples. I already mentioned you have eyewitnesses of Matthew and John. They were, they were, they were firsthand witnesses. Mark, Mark and Luke were not actual disciples, but they received information information firsthand from the disciples, okay? Now, if Jesus didn't exist, why would Paul or Saul of Tarsus be on assignment to have them arrested? Turn, turn with me to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Acts 9, verses 1 and 2. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the, the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if any found who were of the way, that is, the way was the followers of Christ, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That basically he would arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. If Christ was not who he was, who Josephus wrote as a man who did these miracles, if he wasn't that man, why is Saul of Tarsus out there trying to kill them? So we can see through history, there is a map, and there is much, much more. I came across this one uh, uh, professor who just got done completing a 4,500-page draft to send to his publisher, all on the evidence of the resurrection. So, so there, there is so much out there that's available to, to, to justify who he is, but people don't want to believe. You can present this information, but they're going to still choose not to believe. And of course, not, item number four, did Jesus rise from the dead? This is essential. This is essential to our faith. Because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, right? If Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. Or in some uh, translations, your faith is in vain. If he did not rise, he is not the Messiah. He is not the Son of God. He is not who he says he is. And everything else, you can then say, if that didn't happen, then we can't believe anything else. But he did rise. We have evidence. 
We have evidence. There was, there was never a question. Remember, there was never a question about his resurrection. Otherwise, the faith wouldn't have grown. The 120 people up in the upper room on the day of Pentecost would not have gathered if he had not risen because all the disciples saw him. He showed up. He miraculously appeared to them. He showed them he, Thomas, who doubted. I relate a lot to Thomas. I, I want to see. Show me. I don't buy it. Whenever I hear a preacher say, oh, it's right there in the Bible, I'm like, where? This is why I give you chapter and verse. It's not because I'm trying to impress you, because I was a naysayer. I was a skeptic. I want to know, where's it at in the Bible? Show me. Because a lot of people say, well, God said this. And, it, and that's not what he said. And so that's why I give you chapter and verse, so you can see it for yourself and understand it and read it. And we know in Matthew 27, verse 66, that there was a seal put on the tomb. There was a Roman guard placed outside the tomb because they knew that if they were to come and steal the body, they could claim the resurrection. This is what, the, why were the Jews concerned about him resurrecting? Why were the Romans concerned about him resurrecting? Because he said he would. And so if they could stop that from happening, then they could disprove him and say, look at, see, he is not the Messiah. He is not the, the king of the Jews. But it happened. And there were eyewitness accounts to it. And then that, that Sunday morning, Mary and others go to the tomb and see, and they find the tomb empty. Jesus appears. Again, we have eyewitness accounts. People, again, the secular world wants evidence. I say, fine, show me the body of Jesus. What happened to it? You say, you say he didn't rise, show me his body. If, if there is a criminal case going on, there's a question, they can, they can request to exhume a body from the graveyard, from the cemetery. They asked at the time, where's his body? They couldn't, they couldn't provide one. Why? Because he had risen. He had risen. He was alive. There, 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 was, there was no... Why would you base an entire religion, an entire event like this? Now, ladies, don't, please don't be offended. This was the Jewish culture at the time, but they didn't value the testimony of women at the time. Why would they create a story with their primary eyewitnesses as women? Why would they not just say, well, Peter and, and John went to the tomb and saw it was empty? True, that's a true statement. But women went first, and women saw it, and it's recorded that way. Why is it recorded? Because that's what happened, because this is God's word, and it's truth, and, and it's infallible. And so they recorded the way it happened, that women went to the tomb first and saw that it was empty. You can basically say, you know, women were the first first witnesses of, of truly of, of, of Christ because he, he, they were the first ones to declare he was risen. And they'd come back and told the other disciples, our Lord is risen. He's gone. He's not in the tomb. Why would they create a lie? I and mean, why would they create a story based upon relying at the time on a woman's testimony? You'd want to try to create a story that's a little more believable, wouldn't you? You wouldn't, it's like if, if, I'm, if I'm being accused of a crime, I'm not going to grab a bunch of, of ex-cons and criminals to testify on my behalf, right? I'm, I'm going to find somebody more credible that you're going to trust if I'm going to have them defend me. Also, on top of the empty tomb to show that he was risen and the eyewitnesses, right, because he appeared to them in Luke 24, 36, Right, and, and there's several accounts right now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and he said to them, peace, peace to you. He stood there. He showed himself to them. They saw this. But then people might say, well, you know what? They lied. Why would you lie? Why? What was, it wasn't like these disciples. What was their motivation for lying? It wasn't like they had these mega church ministries and they're flying around in gold-plated chariots, you know, because they, you know, they didn't want to lose their money and their income, so they had to keep propagating this lie. No, they were running for their lives. It is, it is, it is considered through church history, not in the Gospels, but things happened after the writing of the Gospels and, and the other books, that 10 of the 12 disciples all faced martyrs' deaths. 
The two that didn't, well, Judas killed himself, and it's believed that John uh, got off of Patmos and went off and died maybe in Turkey in his later years peacefully. But all the others, there are accounts of them facing martyrs' death. That means they were, they were killed for their faith. If it was a lie, do you, don't you think they would have fessed up? What was there for them to gain? Again, what was their motivation? If there's, if there's any police officers here or detectives, you always look at for what's the motivation for the crime? Why are we doing this? Why, what was their, why did they want that done? What were they going to gain from it? It wasn't notoriety. It wasn't wealth. It was the truth that was in them. It was that Christ had changed their lives. Christ had transformed them. Christ had shown them that there was another way. And they didn't have to live the way of the Romans and, and the way of the world, but that there was eternity and there was eternal life. And so, and so, so again, they, he's risen from the dead because of an empty tomb, eyewitness accounts, and the growth of a world religion. There's no way this religion would still be alive 2,000 years later if it was based on a lie. Somebody would have spoke up and said, no, it didn't happen like that. But no, they were hearing firsthand accounts of people seeing the miracles, knowing what happened. And it's why it grew. But I'll, I'll say this to you. I'll say this. All these points that I just bring to you and bring to your attention, if the musicians can make their way forward. All this information I've given to you, if you want to put, consider them bullets in your, in your gun belt or you know, rounds of ammo in your firearm, arrows in your quiver, whatever it is you think it is, is to use it, to get somebody. If you intend and hope to use it for that, I would encourage you, don't. Stop right there. Stop in your tracks. This information is not given to you that you can throw it in someone's face to prove that you're right, to prove that you're smart, or to prove to them that they're wrong, to show them for all the times they ridiculed you. That's not what it's there for. This information is there to give you some, some, some credibility with people who are skeptics. I know because I was one of them. I used to ask these questions. I used to question Christians about their faith. How can they believe these things? How is there any proof that he even really did any of these things? These are the things I used to ask the Christian. And so I, I, I want, I want to, to pose you this question. Back in the opening verse, what reasons do you have for the hope that is in you? I'm going to ask you to do something with these four points, if you wrote them down, if you picked up anything from them, that you use them for one reason only, to show love, to show the love of a Savior, the love of a man, the Son of God, who went to die for them, for the person you're sharing this with. It must be done in love. If you don't do it in love, if you're doing it again just to justify yourself or to prove a point, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, right, we are told that to love one another. And later on in the verse, it reads, for God is love. Jesus has asked, what's the greatest of all the commandments? In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, I'll paraphrase, but Jesus answers, the greatest of all the commandments is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. As anyone stands to your feet, he says love. And the reason why I say this is love, because if you engage somebody in a debate, you engage somebody in an argument without love, it will profit nothing. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, it reads in verse 22, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Pursue, pursue, go chase after righteousness, faith, love, and peace, love, peace. 
He says, pursue that in the very next verse, in verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. Listen to this. He says, avoid foolish arguments, for they generate strife. And this is why I wanted you to get this message at the end of love. That this information may help you and equip you to know how to answer the naysayer, to how to answer the skeptic. But it's all meaningless if you don't do it in love. You've got to do it for the purpose of you want to show them Christ. You want them to see Christ, the hope that is in you, that they would see the love that is in you. In Jude chapter 1, Jude, one chapter, it's just one chapter book right before the book of Revelation. It reads in verse 21 of Jude, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of your Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction, but others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So some, you're going to have to scare them to pull them out of the fire. So you're, you're, there's, there's a... a there's a bad effect in your cause of rejecting Christ. But in the verse before it, and on some have compassion, making a distinction. If you call yourself a Christian today, what did he do? He loved. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Out of love, he gave. I'm asking you, share with love the hope you have in you. I can give you all these points to debunk the skeptic, to derail the non-believer. But the greatest thing you can share, again, when written in 1 Peter, right? What's the reason for the hope you have in you? The greatest reason is what Jesus has done for you. I know my life before Christ. I know how I used to sin. I know how I used to think. I've told you before, I hate to keep bringing it up, but I know I lived my life for man's approval. I did things, I did things in school to be accepted and to be liked. And when I came to Christ, I realized, oh my, what a fraud. Oh my, I did all this just so I could be accepted. I told you I was annoying. Class president all four years, prom king, true, true. Elected most popular. All that happened in high school. What was it getting me? But when I come to know Christ and realize, oh my, people are heading to hell every day and here's one of the questions I was going to touch on because I get this a lot well why would a loving God send people to hell he doesn't he saves you from it he saves us from it this is why he came to save us from hell because our self-righteousness is like filthy rags our wages of sin are death and so he come to save us from hell not to send us but to save this is why he's called a savior Jesus saves. We say these things, they're bumper sticker slogans, but do you grasp the meaning of it? That this is why he came. And hopefully you understand that and you have that that you can share. Like I can just tell you, I was headed, I was headed for the lake of fire. I was headed to hell. Non-believers don't know about the lake of fire. That's when people read it. I was headed to hell. But Jesus, but God, but God. Give the Lord a big round of applause, amen. With, with every head bowed, if there's anybody here today who's never confessed Jesus as Lord, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, you can do that now as the altar workers come and, and you can come to one of these altar workers and pray with them and they will help you to confess your sins and accept Jesus as Lord. And today you can have salvation. Today, if you stick around afterwards, we'll baptize you. Water's still in there. 
when you come forward and confess that Jesus is Lord? The reason why we ask you to come forward because in Matthew chapter 10 it reads that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father, Jesus says. But if you deny me before men, Jesus says, I will deny you before the Father. So come. Come today. Today could be the day of salvation for you. Amen. If you've got any other prayer need, if your, your, your home is fractured, your relationship is drifting apart, if there's sickness in the home, if you have financial challenges, you're afraid of losing your job, you're afraid of, of a situation at work, please come. Let us pray with you. We'll stand in agreement. Because God loves you. He wants you to be mended. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be healed. So come, come and pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask, Lord, you'd bless everybody in the hearing of my voice, my God, whether online or here. My Lord, we just ask that you touch them. Let there be an anointing upon your people, a blessing, Father. Father, let them be reminded of the reason of the hope they have within you or within themselves, that hope they have that it's you that is within them. And I ask, my God, that you would just bless them. Let their burdens be light. Let their worries be gone. Let their troubles be no more. Because you are the great I am. You are our healer, our restorer, our redeemer. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm feeling good.